One of the biggest challenges in any business is actually managing people, managing employees, finding the best possible employees, nurturing those employees, rewarding those employees, retaining those employees, and then dealing with all those who don't turn out to be the ideal employee um, or do turn out to be the employee from hell. That's when it gets particularly difficult because there's a whole range of legal constraints and whatnot. Um, first of all, we need to think of some really basic terms because these shifting of terms over time gives us some indication as to how the very nature of business itself has changed and the relationship of, of managing people to the core competitive advantages of the firm. Historically, in large-scale manufacturing, when labour was just an input and wasn't particularly highly skilled, we used to speak of labour management. Uh, more recently, we talk about human resource management, in Japanese, jinzai. So the sense that uh, the people who work for the company are a key resource, a human resource. And then we go an even step further and say that uh, without these key people, the business has no future whatsoever. And so indeed, a key part of basic business strategy is actually developing the human resources one needs. And if you think about the role of knowledge, intensive resources, if you think about creativity as more and more important in modern business, we see that very clearly they critically depend on having good staff, having the staff who can uh, creatively uh, lead the firm to respond to a rapidly changing business environment, for example. And to develop those capabilities with people is a key part of corporate strategy. So just to reiterate, our, one of our key things with human resource management, of course, is getting good people in the first place, overcoming some really basic problems we've talked about with adverse selection because people are always going to present themselves in a better way than uh, uh, obviously a company would like to uh, see them. Clearly people are going to hide adverse information, negative information about themselves, and they're going to present themselves in the best possible way. So we as uh, employers and as recruiters working for employers are going to have a huge challenge in terms of trying to find out the truth of people when people have a very clear incentive, of course, to selectively represent themselves. And of course, everybody does that. Okay. Um, once you have these talented people inside your organization, or they don't have to be brilliant, but uh, they just have to be able to, to do the job effectively and not alienate your customers, we really obviously want to cultivate their skills and we want to create incentives for uh, employees to perform effectively, to try and align the activities, the motivations, the, uh, in, in a sense, the, the endeavours and even the values of the employees with the enterprise as much as possible. And a lot of that comes down to dealing with those basic issues of moral hazard that we've spoken about. Of course, a key thing in terms of incentivizing people, creating incentives uh, for employees to work well for the business is to uh, lay out a pathway to rewards. It can be through promotion, it can be through bonuses, pay rises, greater responsibility, uh, which of course is then recognized in terms of their roles. And that makes it easier for an employee actually to leave because they can sell their experience and go elsewhere but actually less likely that they would leave because they've been giving more responsibility more growth opportunities so they can see a career path inside the organization uh, one of the key differences across cultures and particularly when we compare japanese business to a lot of western businesses is the extent to which internal versus external labor markets are relied upon an internal labor market simply refers to all of your employees inside the organization and companies that tend to look to its own employees for most of its specialist and generalist manager roles, for example. So for new positions, manager positions, for example, overwhelmingly the recruitment happens inside the company. Okay? Um, the external labor market is any, anyone outside the firm. Whenever a organization advertises externally, recruits externally to bring someone in, they're going to the external labor market. 
So to speak of internalization means that effectively what's happening is that the company is taking greater control of the supply of its own labor. It's uh, establishing a system where it recruits a fairly large number of employees and commits to training up those employees to be able to fill all the skill needs that the company is going to have. That's rather more difficult than it sounds. It was a lot easier to do in the 1950s, the 60s, the 1970s, when even mass manufacturing, uh, for example, was still relatively simple. Maybe the technologies on the manufacturing side were difficult, but on the operational side and on the management side, on the administration side, uh, it was generally white collar work, it was paperwork and whatnot. And so people could be trained up inside those systems. Once we see a dramatic shift towards informatization, that's an ugly word, let's say ICTs, uh, using computers effectively, informatics, um, IT systems, you're seeing more specialist applications. And in so many ways, whether it's managing the supply chain, for example, or whether it's uh, just keeping track of documents internally, all of these things, uh, means that there needs to be more specialist uh, human resources serving the company. Now, one of the challenges over time for Japanese companies has been to try and reconcile this increasing hyper-specialization of work with their old model of a very strong reliance on an internal labor market. So there's a lot of factors which impact, though, on the extent to which one goes outside the labor market, one outsources, in a sense, for employees. Um, in Japan, for example, there was a lot of outsourcing to related companies, subsidiary companies, uh, companies in what we call the same keiretsu or, or group or supplier companies. So there's been a long tradition of that. At the same time, it was rather more difficult to temporarily use employees, um, hakenshain, dispatch workers, for a long period of time because the labor law was quite strict. With the liberalization of law on that, we see a significant growth in that dispatch work, in that hakenshain um, role particularly from the 1990s. So simply to summarize, there are some notable implications for internalization. What happens here? Companies need to train existing staff for specialist roles. And this generally means that the recruitment of staff will focus on general abilities, an ability to learn, a learning orientation, rather than specialists that they're plugging into an existing role. And this has been the typical model in Japan of recruiting the Shinsotsu, uh, wanting to take them from the universities that, uh, by virtue of their, their name, their brand, their stature, implied, implied, it's not always guaranteed, but implied that the uh, graduates were bright, um, motivated, were quite capable of learning, so would learn on the job, OJT, quite effectively. So one of the implications of hiring people inside the company, incentivizing them, giving them rewards to stay, for example, seniority-based wages, is that the employee should identify strongly with the firm. But there is this moral hazard problem. If they think they have a job for life, perhaps they will lose motivation if they're not afraid of being sacked, for example. And of course, it also means high fixed costs. If you've got a lot of permanent employees, and if suddenly the external business environment declines, this can be very challenging for companies. Uh, it's often argued, in fact, that Japanese companies outsourced a lot of work to related companies and supplier companies in a stable way to take pressure off themselves during the downturns. Because they couldn't sack core employees, see Shane, uh, instead, the pressures of dealing with bad business environment could be shifted to the supply companies. Now, one of the other problems with internalization is just simply bringing in specialist technical and managerial expertise, and especially on the managerial side, because if there's a strong expectation amongst the seishine, the permanent employees, that they work for a certain number of years and get promoted, suddenly to bring someone from outside and to put them into a senior role above someone who's been inside the company for many years can promote dissatisfaction. We've seen, for example, in companies such as Nissan, which developed a model 
under the former CEO Carlos Ghosn, for example, of recruiting senior managers from outside the firm, that there have been reports of some dis dissatisfaction amongst long-term Nissan employees who felt they were being overlooked for key management roles with this process of bringing in outsiders, chuto sayo. But it's always a trade-off because there are lots of talented people from outside the firm who can bring a fresh perspective. And we can see benefits and disadvantages. I think uh, the discussion there implies that. Um, some of the benefits, you can train staff for the technical needs of the company. And if you keep those employees, if you invest in them, you can earn a return on your investment. If you train staff up and then they just quit and move to your rival, you've effectively raised the human capital level of your rival firms. So there will be various ways to attempt to lock employees in if you're going to invest in them. One of the ways to do this is through pension schemes, taishuk in retirement benefits and things like that that make it costly for employees to leave mid-career. Generally when the labour market is tight, when it's difficult to get new employees, uh, particularly mid-career, this is a good, can be a very good strategy to invest in growing your own talented employees. Also to protect firm know-how, if you're not constantly losing employees, you can keep your firm specific human knowledge in the form of your employees inside the organisation. They don't take it to uh, rivals. And insofar as they have firm-specific human capital, employees know very well how to work for your company, but that skill set doesn't necessarily transfer to another company. Actually, they're a bit trapped because another company uh, wouldn't pay them the same amount that you would, the, the, uh, the employer would, uh, because those skills aren't necessarily transferable, which means the employee is a bit trapped. And there's a very important lesson for you here. Whenever, when you're working, you get a opportunity to develop your skills, uh, to move into a new role, for example, uh, it's always better to try and move into a role where you're going to develop skills and knowledge that you can sell outside the company. Um, doing things inside the company that are unique to the systems of that company, you may be well valued inside the company, although the company doesn't need to value that much because you can't take those skills outside. If on the other hand, the skills you've developed working for one company are transferable, are sellable, then the company has to do more to keep you in the first place. And you also have more opportunities. So in a nutshell, Japan's lifetime employment system offered a whole range of benefits to companies, uh, particularly after World War II, when companies were short of capital but were growing, growing rapidly, Japan's population was still relatively young. So effectively, employees were committed to the company, management invested in them, there was in a shared commitment, little loss of the firm's knowledge-based competitive advantages, but over time, it became rather more costly as the age-wage profile got older. Uh, and indeed now, many Japanese companies have overcome that problem because the baby boomers have now largely retired en masse. In the last few years each year, the, uh, the Japanese labour market shrunk by nearly a, a million workers. But there's also another really important point. Although it was often called lifetime employment, very often Japanese core employees, say Shane, they didn't get anywhere near life uh, time employment. Very often it finished in their mid 50s, sometimes even 53 or 54, and companies found a second life for their employees, sent them to a subsidiary company, a Korgeisha, for example, or a supplier. Now in the last decade or so, that's become rather more difficult to do. So many Japanese companies have been pushing up the retirement age somewhat because they haven't been able to find this uh, second life, second career for their core employees. Another important thing to keep in mind is that only medium and large size companies ever really offered lifetime employment. In many fields, tenshoku, shifting jobs, moving from one to another was quite common. 
And even in the case of smaller companies who would like to keep employees, uh, very often they simply couldn't afford to do that in the downturns because they couldn't pass on the costs. A final thing is that many Japanese companies have realized that there are real costs to internalization of just simply relying on the people who work for your company. Firstly, much less learning from outside the company. And particularly as technological levels, uh, have, levels of specialization have become higher and higher over time, many Japanese companies have found themselves disadvantaged by excessive reliance on the skill set within the company. They realize that either hiring in outsiders or outsourcing more business functions is the only way that they can compete by building their basic uh, technical uh, capabilities inside the company. Things like systems integration, for example, when you're, you're running so much of your business operations through IT systems that have to be able to talk to each other, for example. They're not the skill sets that generally Japanese companies have been able to develop inside the firm. Also, an organizational culture can become very fixed and conservative and prejudiced against new ways of, of doing things. Uh, this is a big difference between Waseda University and Tokyo University, for example. Almost all the professors at Tokyo University are graduates of Tokyo University. Very difficult uh, to be otherwise, unless you're a foreigner. Um, Waseda, however, has been much more open to hiring uh, professors who are graduates from other universities. In fact, our uh, dean, as I speak now, is a graduate of Keio University. So Waseda benefits from having many different perspectives on universities coming to work for Waseda. Now, the final thing, of course, is the adverse selection the moral hazard problem. That if a company has a reputation for lifetime employment, there is the danger that people will just want to join the company for that reason, that they actually have low motivation. Uh, they don't really want to work very hard. They just want a job where they're not going to get sacked. And this has historically been a problem in many countries when people choose to go to work for government roles, for example. Uh, they go more for the security, not for the challenge, not out of any sense of service. And then, of course, the moral hazard problems we've talked about. That even if people join the company and they're highly motivated in the first place, if they look around and other people are being lazy, they think they can't get sacked and they think, well, well who cares, uh, let's take it easy, then people may lose their own motivation. So it can be demoralizing for the best employees who are motivated and then might leave, and others who might work hard under the right conditions, if they look around and see other people not working very hard, they might start to feel a little bit silly that they're the only ones actually making an effort and being responsible. And so the moral hazard problems arise. Uh, the, the culture becomes more entitled, more lazy, less creative, risk averse, for example rather than innovative. And for any organization in particular that faces competition in, in the market for its goods and services, ultimately this could actually threaten the, uh, the very survival of the organization. And it's very difficult to change a corporate organization uh, quickly. Normally when an organization realizes it has troubles, uh, it's often too late to fix.